Firstly, to my dear respected brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the ability to focus, to make Allah the focus of this reminder. For in every single house, there is a focus. Every single body, there is a focus. Every family unit has a focus. And whether we want to agree or disagree, we have to admit to something that we all have a focus amongst ourselves. So in the family unit, <coughs> when the family is together, in the conversations that we have, in the things that are important to ourselves, things that we value, things that we don't value, times when we are criticizing people in our households, times when we are talking good about someone or something. Over time, the children who are growing up in that household, the people who are living in that household, will clearly see that there is a clear focus of the people in this house of their values and of the things that they think are the most important things in their lives. So that could be over time, it could be, money could be a very important thing in the house, it could be family values, it could be other people, it could be someone within the family. <coughs> Something or someone is going to become a focal point inside the house. And in every single gathering there is a focus, there is a focal point. And the one that has understood the real essence of Tawheed. What does Tawheed mean? Tawheed means the oneness of Allah. The one who has understood the real essence of Tawheed. Tawheed is not a few pages of a book. Tawheed is not a, Tawheed is not a thick book. Tawheed is not just a study program. Tawheed is not a study course alone. The real part of Tawheed is your focal point. That's what Tawheed is. <coughs> if you really look deep into the sources, you'll see that Tawheed is one's focal point. Which means that this thing governs everything else within your life. <coughs> this thing governs everything else within your life. When I say everything, when I say everything, I mean everything. I mean your physical actions, your mental abilities, your intellectual abilities, your spiritual direction, your own ambitions, your, your future and how you're going to start planning your future. That focal point, whatever it is, is going to start directing everything that you've got. And though most of us claim, and we all as, as good Muslims, any good Muslim, if you ask them, you know, who's the most important you know, being in your life? You know, most good Muslims will say what? It's Allah. 
and most good Muslims or most Muslims will say that. But reality is another. And children speak the truth because they don't most of the time understand politics. So if you were to go to a child and say, what's really important to your dad? What's really important to your mom? And they'll start speaking. If you really, if you really give them a good platform, they'll start speaking. And it can be, it can be scary what they might say, and it might be, it might be a good credit that you might get after what they say. And if, if they really speak their mind, and they say, my mom, what's important to her is that she gets a bit of time to rest. Or well, my dad, his important thing is that he's able to get his business secured or the money that he wants. Or well, my <clears throat> brother, he wants to pass his grades. My sister, she wants to get this job. One thing or another will be something that they'll tell you what is really important in the lives of these people who are in the household. And what's important here is, for us, is to ask ourselves a question right now and say, what, what would my child say? And if you, if you dare, if you dare, you can go home and you can, you can ask someone who's young, who's got a fresh, clean mind, and they could tell you what is it that governs your own thoughts. If that child says, my dad, it's really important for him to pray. My dad, it's important for him. And you can see, you know, within their words, they'll choose words. And, and if you give them a free platform, subhanAllah, some of the things that they'll come up with, some of the things that they'll come up with, what is important to your mother and father? Because their own ambitions, their own, their own thoughts, their future is being shaped by your talks and your conversations within the household. Whatever you feel is important, they too are picking up on that. So when they see a father who's crazy for football, I can guarantee you the boy will grow up and is going to start becoming crazy for football. And most sons, they are followers or supporters of the dad's football team. Yes? The dad's a Spurs fan, the son's a Spurs fan. Most cases. Only some cases probably don't like his dad for whatever reason. But, or his team for whatever reason. <coughs> And he might basically just change and switch. So, but I'm telling you there is, there is a great thing in how Allah has created the human, the human mind and the human self. Because we have been created, this is the really important, and I'm going to give you some principles in this talk. Because I just don't want this, this whole reminder just to be about something which, I, you know, I, I want this, this re reminder to be something that you can listen, and I, I hope inshallah I can listen myself again and again and say to myself, these are, these are points which you can play at any point of your life and say that, you know what, how do I react to this? Because there's another thing. I might say something today, five years down the road, your lives are changing and my lives are changing. If I ask you right now, go five years back. Was, was your life the same as what it is today? And you will answer no. Environment has changed, or someone came to the family, or someone went out to the family. Right? Or someone was in the family, no one's gone out, no one's got come in, but they've all grown. And with each growth, you get a new challenge. Each growth, you get a new challenge. Every five years, guaranteed, the whole environment has changed. You go ten years back, you ask yourself the same question. Am I, am, am I different from that? Am I saying that you will have to tell me that you are different? Even if you're stuck in the same house with the same four walls with no one increasing your family, no one decreasing, I can guarantee there will be difference in the way the mind is thinking. It's, this is with age. So the principles that I'm going to talk about in this talk 
I want you to reflect on those principles with what I'm saying, and you can reflect on them, inshallah, again and again. So one thing which is guaranteed is that there's a focal point. And Tawheed means that Allah should become the focal point. And when Allah becomes the focal point, the whole dynamics <coughs> changes. The whole dynamics changes. Everything changes. If, for example, I am to go home and expect my wife to be different and good, then Tawheed would mean, the oneness of Allah would mean that my focus is on this Allah who is going to make me stand in front of him naked, uncircumcised, barefoot, without anything on him, in front of him on the day of judgment. And so is my wife, my kids, my other people, whoever it is, they're going to stand. So if I'm going to admonish her with something, I need to think about myself. And the hadith is quite clear. Whoever will make it easy for someone in this world, hadith in Muslims, whoever will make something easy for someone in this world, for someone who's got difficulty, then Allah will make ease for him on the day of judgment. So if you think to yourself, you know, I could go ahead now and I could say something to my wife, or a wife thinks I could say something to my husband, and you think, you know what, I'm going to let go. <coughs> when would you let go? You would let go by knowing that more important than your husband and more important than your wife is your focal point, which is Allah. And if that becomes the reason, then you can let go. It's so easy to let go. It's so easy to forgive because you look at the bright, you look at the, you look at your focal point because he's not only the focal point for the day of judgment, he's the focal point here. And it starts here. So you could say to yourself that I will let go today and I will inshallah have a prosperous time on the day of judgment and Allah will let me off on something. The same hadith says, Whosoever will help someone in this world, Allah will help them in the next world. A hadith in Bukhari says, certain businessmen will come up on the day of judgment. And Allah will say to them, you know, what is it that what is it that you you bought for me? So these businessmen will not have much. They will not have much that they will be able to show Allah on the day of judgment. Allah will say, have you got anything that you used to do for people? So you know, you know businessmen, how they are, they're, they're busy with business. And hopefully you're not too busy for your family. Hopefully you're not too busy for Allah. But as long as you're genuinely trying to look for your own means of you know, livelihood and so on, this person on the Day of Judgment, and this is a hadith in Bukhari, Allah will say, have you, have you done something unique for me? in the world and the businessman will say oh Allah you know I haven't got anything really to offer you but I've got one thing what is that Allah will say the businessman will say that when people used to come and barter with me in the marketplaces I didn't used to become hard in bargaining I was easy on them in bargaining I used to give them a good price and instead of you know some some businessman you try and get something that you know, something's a uh, you know I don't know, 50 quid, and, or you know, especially when we're talking about uh, Bangladesh, Pakistan, yeah? <laughs> we want to take 50 taka off you, they will price it at, at 250. And then they're bartering with you, or they'll price it at 200. And they know that you're going to say something like 25, then he'll say no, 150, 125. You'll say something, you know, 40, and he'll say something like 60, whatever, whatever it is, and then you probably end up selling it 50 if you're really lucky. But if you're a mug like me, you'll end up paying double the price and give a hundred and you take it. But you know, you know, I, I go to these, um, you know, every time I go to these marketplaces, I barter with them. And I really, you know, I give them a bit of a hard time. Yeah? You might think, why am I doing it? <laughs> give them a bit of a hard time. You know why? Because he probably thinks, you know, this guy's from London <laughs> doing me. So you give them a bit of a hard time, and then you get the right price, and then after that, I tip him with an extra 50 taka, extra 100 taka. And he says, you give me too much. I say, keep it. 
because my point wasn't to try and, you know, poor man, trying to make a bit of business. Now this businessman will say, he'll say that I used to do business, but Allah, I used to go easy in bargaining with people. You know what Allah will say, according to the hadith of Bukhari, he will say, oh my servant, you used to be with easy with people in bargaining. Today I'm going to be easy with you in this bargaining. I'm going to let you go to Jannah. Just go. Just go. You know the focal point, now why would that businessman do that? Because the thing is you have a good heart. See what's more important, this is another principle I'm saying is, it's, it's, it's really important to have a sharp brain. But it's also important to have a loving heart. And there's a very fine balance between the two. There's a very fine balance between the two. And there is something that Allah has said in Surah Rahman, which is, He, he says, mizan. He has given us a balance. And He has said, Allah taqawfil mizan. Do not break the balance. Do not break this balance that I've, that I've given to you. <laughs> what this means is, in everything in life, there is a balance. With children, there is a balance. With the wife, there is a balance. With her husband, there is a balance. Family life, there is a balance. And what people forget is, that you've got to balance between the head and your rational, your, your, your rational thoughts and between the heart and your feelings. You've got to balance between the two. And you will find it very easy if you make Allah your main concern. If you make Allah your focus, it will be, it will be easy for you to do that. What do I mean by this? You can be, and Allah has given us different, Allah has given us different, different, um, uh, you know, characters. Some of us are born, some of us are born with a harsh side to us. We're more to do with the head, less to do with the heart. And some of us are born more to do with the heart and less to do with the head. But you know one thing that you must understand is though the people who are more towards the head run the world, yeah? <laughs> though the people who are more to do towards the head less towards the heart. Most of them run the world. But most of them that will enter Jannah first on the Day of Judgment will be those towards the heart. Remember that. Because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa when he praised the believers, one of the words that he used for the believers is the simple. Simplicity is a very good quality of the believer. Though we need to be Though we at the same time need to be, you know, clever, but a mu'min is not cunning. See, clever is one thing, cunning is another. If you, if, if you, you know, a lot of people in this day and age, they mix the two. They think clever and cunning is, is being cunning is extra clever. You're more smarter, but you're not, you're not. You can, you can do a few deals here and rip a few people off, or you could be cunning and you know, get your way through here and there, but the thing is, Allah is watching you, my brother. And how far are you going to go? How far are you going to go? I will tell you that the more straightforward, simple, the believing heart is, the more Allah is with you. Allah is with you. And I will tell you one other principle, which is sabr or patience. So sometimes you're in a situation in a family life and you're the one doing the suburb. Whether you're the wife, whether you're the child, whether you're the parent, whether you're the you know, brother, sister, whoever you are, husband, you're the one who's doing the suburb, the patience. What you've got to remember is that Allah, when He said in the Quran, He is with, He is with someone. He did not say that He is with the clever ones. He did not say, Inna Allah ma'a ulil albab. Nowhere in the Quran you will see that. With the most intelligent, he did not say that. He did not say, I'm even with the knowledgeable ones. He did not say that. He did not even say, I'm with the ones who practice what they can say that. With, he used, the word with, he used with three different categories of people. One is sabirin, those who are patient. Inna Allah ma'a sabirin. And he has said, Ma'al Muttaqeen, those who are conscious of him, aware of him, 
And they are so aware of him that they stay away from sin because this awareness keeps them away from sin. And he said, Ma'al Muhsineen, those who are excellent in their action when they perform them. These three. In Allah, Ma'al Sabiri, Ma'al Sabiri, Ma'al Ma'al Muttaqin, Ma'al Ma'al Muhsineen. But with cunning people, he is not with them. He is not with them. In fact, he says, you, you, your cunningness, your, tri your, your tricks could move a mountain. Mountains could move with that. But you're not getting over Allah with this. So in a family, in a household, if you are in the position of being sabr, what you should know is that Allah is with you. Not with the dhalim. See, the dhalim or the oppressor, because there are families that there's an oppressor. There's husbands that intimidate wives. There's wives that intimidate husbands. There's some cases like that. There are husbands that feel that they're so overpowering over children that they can do what they want. And the children are the mazloom or they are the people who are the victims of oppression. And the, and the father, whoever it is, they're, they're the oppressor. And what you've got to understand is the zalim, Allah has said, Inna Allah la yahdi al Allah will not guide the one who is an oppressor. Because what will happen is, in a case of oppression and, and in a case of, of sabr, when, when, when there's someone who's committing oppression and someone else who's having patience, you have to know Allah is with the one who's patient, but Allah will not guide the people who are oppressive. What does that mean? That means they'll get away, they'll get away with the law, but Allah will guide them towards their own destruction. Allah will guide them to their destruction. So again, let's, let's, let's take a step back. <clears throat> there's the mind, there's the heart. And there are, you know, you, you can be, you can be a person. I work, from Rasulullah sunnah is to balance the two. On one side, on the one side, on the one side, he said, "La tarfa anhum asaka adana." This is a hadith in Ahmed. He said, "Don't completely remove your stick away, so that you may teach adab and discipline." But on the other side, he said, The best of you will not hit. SubhanAllah, the balance is there. The balance is what? The balance is, on the one hand, you keep some form of discipline. You've got the stick there. But the other, on the other hand, you don't use the stick. This is where the sunnah lies. Because Rasulullah ﷺ, he never ever hit anyone. And he said, خِيَارُكُمْ خِيَارُكُمْ لِأَهْلِي وَأَنَا خِيَارُكُمْ لِأَهْلِي كُنْ حَدِيثٍ تَنِّبِي He said, the best amongst you are the best to their families. And I am the best to my family. So it's a very, it's a very difficult one because you think in all the aspects, Rasulullah so kept his balance. When he spoke, when he had to discipline, he was, he was firm at times. He was firm. But he was a gentle firmness. See, there's a balance in that. When his Sahaba, because his Sahaba, his, his Sahaba, they were his students. And you know, students, sometimes they can cross the boundaries. And when his, when his companions, they crossed the boundaries, he showed that he was not happy with what they did. But he did not say things to them that he would regret tomorrow. That's the important thing. There's got to be balance. The balance is you can get angry, fine. But it's what you do and how you use it. Because if you've got control over yourself, then you can manipulate the situation in the right way. A lot of people, they get angry. When they get angry, their emotions are high. Their heart is, you know, this, that, that, the emotions, down at the heart, very high. What happens is, this thing here, their mind, where they're supposed to think straight, is low. And at that time, they could say things, and there's a lot of brothers who say things that they only regret the next day. And the sisters who say a lot of things. In fact, so you know, sisters on, on, on some occasion they do this more than men. I'm not, I'm not saying that the men don't do this. But sisters on, on, on a good scale of, you know, uh, hundred sort of people, you probably find I don't know maybe seventy sort of odd sisters would probably do it, and thirty odd men out of every hundred would do it. But you, the, the tongue and all of that is, is from what coming from where? Where is it being, where is it being moved from? It's being moved from the heart. 
and it's been moved from here. That's why the passage that is from here, from the heart, all the way to the, to, to the brain here, that whole passage is called the Qalb. The whole passage is called the Qalb. Qalb, which, you know, in a, literally if you, if you translate Qalb, Qalb would mean what? Mean what? It, means, it means the, the heart. But you look in the Quran, you will find that Allah has said, Alahum biha. Allah said, don't they have hearts with, with which they can think, they can use their intellect with. And in other places you will find that Allah has said hearts to have love. In other places Allah has said hearts to ponder, to think. Allah said now the Quran. Don't they, they, don't they, they ponder? Now pondering, when you ponder over the Quran, what do you ponder with? With your mind, with your head. But Allah said, or oh, do their hearts have locks on them? So clearly Allah has made, made a connection between these two. What that means is that we think, we think with both of these involved. Your emotions and your, your mind, your head, your intellect, both of them have consultancy. They have a consultation between themselves before we make a decision. But sometimes this one becomes stronger than down here. Emotions become stronger and sometimes the head becomes stronger. When a person's head is stronger, you are bereft of love, of sympathy. You're full of apathy. When the, when the heart is stronger, you are not thinking straight. You could be blind in what you're saying because you're not thinking straight. So what is important here is when you look at Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he, had to, when he had to control people with his, with his tongue or with his physical abilities, Rasulullah had a balance between the two. But what's another principle which is important is the spirituality of a person. You know, I could tell you these words and you could tell me words. Some people's words have a big effect. Some people's words, some people Allah has naturally give them an effect in their words. And some people, they can have an effect when their spirituality is high. And Rasulullah was one of these individuals. You, O Messenger, you pass on a message that is going to reach within their hearts, inside. Now Rasulullah's spirituality was such that if you were around him, first you had, you, you kind of had his awe, you were inspired with awe. Next thing is you loved him. You actually loved him to bits. Rasulullah you couldn't leave his gathering without missing his gathering again. Now this is not just for adults. The children love Rasulullah Why? Because another principle I'm going to tell you is that you have to adapt to different people according to their mentality. He said, place people in their places. Put them onto their own levels. And when you speak to them, speak to them according to their mentality. So when Rasulullah would speak to a child, it, he would do it in a way that the child will understand. It's not important about the you know, specific you know, high vocabulary. He wasn't looking at that or the technical ways of getting this child to speak. Rasulullah would speak according to the mentality of the child. So for example, when he was in Salah in a tent, in just before the Battle of Badr, and his companions has, had caught this, this, this young boy in the, in, the, in the vicinity, they brought him into the tent and they said to him, they said, Child, there's a young, young boy, young boy. How many enemies are there? Because they hadn't seen the army yet. They said, how many enemies are there? And he said, I don't know, I don't know. So they start slapping him up. And Rasulullah is in Salah. They asked him again, they said, and, and when they were slapping him up, he said, okay, okay, I'll tell you, I'll tell you. So, so they would say, okay, how many, how many were there? And he said, I don't know. So they start slapping him up. And when Rasulullah finished his Salah. He said, leave him. When he's telling you the truth, you stop slapping him. Or when he's telling you the lie, you start salah slapping him. And Rasulullah said, now you look at his sunnah. His sunnah was what? He said to the child, he said, 
O oh child, did you see them when they were when they were sitting or well, when they were going to cook a meal? He said, Yes. He said, Oh child, how many camels did they slaughter? And he said, between nine and ten. Rasulullah said they are between nine hundred and a thousand. Why? Because Arabs have a way of slaughtering one camel that those times between a hundred men. So when they <laughs> It's such a nice way of getting this, this answer out of this child. Because you've got to ask the right question. You know, I really get annoyed. I get annoyed when sometimes you're trying to even examine kids and you give them a, a question which they, don't un which they don't understand. It's not that he doesn't know the answer. He knows the answer, but you didn't give the right question. But anyway, here, Rasulullah tells us how he was with children. <laughs> you talk to people according to their ability of understanding. And he did this over his lifetime. When he talked to the Bedouins, he talked to them according to their mentality. When he talked to the, the sophisticated Arabs, he talked to them according to their abilities. And the Quran is a witness to this. When, when, the, um, when the ayats in Makkah came down, they came for the Makkah people who were, who were very highly, you know, um, they, they were well versed in Arabic. And they, they had a very high understanding of Arabic. So, so those, those Makkah ayats, the, 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 the difficult words in there, but in Medina he didn't have that challenge, so the ayats changed, because you're talking to different people here. Now, talking to people according to their level, when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he talked to, now look at him, he is 50, 53, and he has Sayyidatuna Aisha radiallahu anha, According to different narrations, either she was nine or she was nineteen when she came to the house of the Prophet. <coughs> according to Bukhari, it's nine, according to other books, it's nineteen. But what, 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 what the, the fact is, there's a massive age gap here, but she loved him, absolutely adored him. Why? Because he came down to her level. And when he went to him, when, when he wrote to the kings of his time, they could they could have a good intellectual debate with him. When those priests came inside the masjid, they could have the debate with him. Why? Because he now spoke on their level. So this is one thing that we, got. we can't break this principle. If you break this principle, then you, you're going to... See, any of these things you break, the mizan that Allah said, the balance Allah said, means that you keep the balance right. If you start toppling it over to one side or the other, you're going to start seeing awkward circumstances. So, <clears throat> one thing is that we, we have to have the spirituality. So the spiritual level in a house is very important. You know, you, when you get married, this, this is the, I mean, the talks is the strange in the living room, right? Strange in the living room. So it's a very good uh, title, whoever chose that. Because you could say now, who's the stranger? Well, the first stranger is your wife. <laughs> then it's your child. Then after a while it's another child, and later on you grow, you grow, and then perhaps one day you become the stranger in the house. Right? That's the dangerous thing. Hopefully you don't become the stranger in your own house. But some children might start ending up seeing their parents when they get married as, you know, that dada is getting a bit too older now, you know? So you might end up now, what you've got to do, and what I've got to do is, you've got to understand that a person has an outer and a person has an inner. The outer, just as you marry that woman and the woman married the man, the outer was beautiful, fine. Please don't forget that the inner, if it's not more beautiful than the outer, you've got a big problem. That's why when Rasulullah told us to choose, he said you choose according to the deen. He said the beauty, fine. He said the lineage, <clears throat> people get married for the lineage, People get married for the, the wealth, but he said, Fakhtar ad deen he said, choose the deen. Now that's, that's with the wife. In Surah, number, uh, surah 30, verse 21, Allah said, لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا You will be able to settle with her. She's going to be able to settle with you as soon as you get married. You know what happened to most married men? Most married men, right, the ones that got married seriously, yeah? <laughs> Not the ones that just kept their dads happy. 
right? Because there are, there are guys who just want to keep the dad's side. It's a horrible <coughs> thing. Horrible thing. Don't you force your child to get married. Because if the guy doesn't want her, he's going to ruin a, a, another man's daughter's life. Okay? Now imagine, Allah says, imagine Allah said in the Quran, you will be able to settle with us. Straight away you see this. The guy you used to see him all the time. Suddenly he gets married and you don't see him for months. <laughs> right? You guys are laughing, yeah, that's what happens, isn't it? You don't see him for months. He said, what's happened to you, man? What's happened now? He had to divorce you to get married to her, right? Basically, he was so close to his friend, he was almost like married to you. And now he's with that. That's what happened. Because sukun. See, sukun is that you're now settling. You settle with your body and you settle with your mind. But that is something Allah has given you as a gift. In order for you to get is this, the Quran gives different words. One is sukun. Sukun is that you settle. But the Quran has given a mental, absolute tranquility. Mentally, when you're absolutely serene and you're tranquil, what's that word in the Quran? That word in the Quran is itminan. And Allah has said in Surah Ra'd, verse number, or ayah number 28, Only through my remembrance will hearts, will hearts, قلوب, the whole mind, the whole heart, the whole intellect, all of that will be content, absolutely content through what? Through my dhikr, through my remembrance. And what I want to say here is that I've got married, you got married. Or some of you boys sitting here, girls, listen to this, you're not married yet, you're looking to get married. Remember that when you got married, Allah will give you the sukun straight away. You'll settle, that's fine. But to, in order to keep that lasting, you have to do two things. To keep the sukun lasting, to keep the, you know, for both of you to be settled in the marriage, you have to do two things. So Allah said, جَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّ وَرَحْمَةً In that ayah surah room 21. Mawadda wa Now, mawadda means there's a difference between mawadda and hub. Hub is general love. It's general love. So, if you can have hubbul mal, you can have love for wealth, you can have love for this dunya, you can have love for the house, you can have love for children. Whatever. Love is a, is a common thing. But mawadda is something different. Wood, wad, mawadda is something different. That means it's an unconditional love. Mawadda is unconditional love. When Allah is wadud, He loves you, Allah loves you without a reason to love you. That's what wadud means. So when you love your wife, when the wife loves the husband, if you do what Allah said in, the, in this ayah, is that you love your wife or the wife loves the husband unconditionally. I'm not loving you for your beauty. I'm not loving you because you're so glamorous, you're so nice. You sort of, you know, you know, stir some feelings into my heart. I'm not loving you for that reason. Because okay, fine, alhamdulillah, your wife might, you know, create those, you know, th those thoughts inside your heart. That's fine. But how long is she going to carry on looking like that? She can't carry on looking like that forever. How long does wealth last? One day it's the inheritance of someone else. One day they may lose it. So if it's a conditional love, once that thing has gone, that you, it was conditional upon, then you will, your love will also be gone. Mawadda means I love you unconditionally, which is because I got married to you. I love you, finished. Allah has told me to love you. And the second thing is rahma. I will have mercy on you. A husband needs to have mercy on the wife. Wife needs to have mercy on the husband. If these two things, mawadda and rahma, Unconditional love and mercy are fulfilled, then you will have a good life of settlement, peace inside your marriage. You will be settled. You will not, you know, nothing doesn't get to rock the boat between yourselves. And if you're a husband or a wife, listen to this, anything, my God, where did I go wrong? All you have to do is just bring these two things back. Just go home and start showing your unconditional love. Do things, go out of your way and do things. Because why? Why not? You said one day in front of an imam, in a masjid, or wherever it was, in a hall, wherever your nikah was, you said, nakahtuha, qabiltuha, she said, nakahtuhu, qabiltuhu, whatever the words you use, okay? What are these words? The imam recited three verses before you got married. And all three verses have one thing in common. 
which is you beware of Allah. Ya yunasu taqu rabbakum. Surah An-Nisa verse number one. Second one. Ya ibn ladina amu taqu Allah. O you who believe, have, be, no, be conscious of Allah. Ayah number 102 of Surah Ali Imran. And ayah number 70, 70 of Surah Ahzab. Allah says, Ya ayu ladina amu taqu Allah. Wa qulu khawlan sadida. All three of them have one thing in common. Like, beware of me, beware of me, beware of me. And the first one Allah says, I gave, don't forget, I gave you the permission to get together. The first one. The second one says, you want to be aware of me, don't be aware of me like you think you should be aware of me. You be aware of me as you ought to be aware of me. Ya ayyul ladina amu taqullaha haqqa tuqati. Not how you think taqwa is done, how I want taqwa to be done. And the second one gives another reminder, which is what? That your taqwa with your wife, with your wife, you beware, and you with your husband, you beware of me in between. You beware of me. وَلَا تَمُوتُنَّ إِلَّا وَأَنْتُمْ مُسْلِمُونَ Don't you come to death except that you submitted yourselves to me. Marriage is a way to try and submit yourself to God. You try and control one big danger, that is between your eyes. That thing between our eyes, it can drive us crazy. It can drive us crazy. So Allah has told us, okay, you want to settle in this, you get married. Once you get married, you're settled. Now the next thing is, it's half a face. Get close to me. And the next thing, next ayah which Rasulullah used to recite is what? That be upright in your speech. Make sure that you don't make any hindrances in what you're saying here. If you're honest in what you're saying, you're going to be aware of me in this marriage. Always remember me in this marriage. Be conscious of me in this marriage. Fear me in this marriage. And yusfih lakum a'malakum. I will rectify your deeds. Yaghfir lakum dhunubakum. I will forgive your sins. And the last part of the last ayah that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa used to recite, and every imam recites before a nikah is, وَمَنْ يُتْعِ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ فَقَدْ فَازَ فَوْزًا عَظِيمًا You obey Allah and you obey Allah's Messenger. You will be most successful. You will have a great success indeed. So in marriage, now reflect, go back with these ads right now, 10 years after marriage, 20 years, some of you after your marriage, 5 years after your marriage, and now think about these ads, how relevant they are. Have I been aware of Allah in the current situation I am? If I haven't, I need to go back and make some amendments. Go back, give an unconditional love, have mercy, and you will see you will have supreme. But the one thing you will not get is itminam. Itminan is total contentment inside, absolute serenity. And what is, what is that? Subhanallah al Allah has made for us, for the body to be content, for the body to be content, Allah has given us hearts that can have dhikr. But the, for the house to be content, the house has got a heart. The house has got a heart, the must has got a heart. You might think I'm talking nonsense here. I'm not talking nonsense here. The masjid has got heart, not just one heart, but hearts. It's the hearts of the believers inside the masjid that keep the masjid alive. And in a house, it's those individuals that live inside the house and their hearts put together that makes the heart of the house. Now, if you have in that house constantly, you have movies being played, television on all the time. There's constantly just people just on the internet. You've got people just either eating, sleeping, using the toilet, gossiping, in and out, in and out, playing, playing games, and there's little bit of liquor inside the house, or maybe no liquor inside the house, then now you tell me the situation of that house. That house is going to be a house with a heart that needs surgery. What does that mean? The barakah of your house is going. My brother, my sister, I'm telling you this. You want to bring peace in your house? You try this out. I have seen this with my own eyes. I've given, given this remedy to a lot of people. You know, husband ends up, wife ends up, quarreling and quarreling and quarreling. Right? And sometimes it's so petty. My God, they're quarreling.